Uh, I'm Ernest Muller from Austin, Texas, uh, and I'm here to talk to you about a series of DevOps transformations that I've helped lead. Before you ask, no, I am not Paul Blart Mall Cop. Uh, uh, I get that question frequently, but uh, I, I spent the uh, first 10 years of my career in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, working uh, for both FedEx, like huge enterprise IT, and then startup IT. And then I came to Austin and embarked on a series of four DevOps transformations, or that's what they would become be, be known as once the word DevOps got invented. Uh, and so what I wanted to do is just share with you all, like this isn't a big theory talk, I'm going to go through the four different transformations I was part of, explain, explain the problems, explain what we did, explain how it turned out, and show you kind of four, four different ones that are designed to address four different situations. So the first company that I worked for in Austin is called National Instruments. Uh, they make uh, test and measurement hardware and software for the scientific and engineering market. Uh, their products help uh, power everything from the uh, super collider to Lego robotics. Uh, has anybody here ever used LabVIEW? Yeah. Ah, all right, we've got a couple of LabVIEW users. So uh, my first job there was managing web systems team. So the uh, the National Instruments uh, website was very important to their operations. Like a lot of a lot of sales went through it, half their leads, all their product information, uh, and they had a large team of developers uh, working on it, and hundreds of applications and a variety of stacks. Uh, it, it had it had uh, moved over time from Notes Domino to uh, to Oracle PL SQL, like straight PL SQL, uh, to Java, to you know variety of uh, variety of things, uh, and that they were aggressively growing. So the problems that we faced there was the the previous team management had been actively anti-automation, and I, I don't know if any of you have been in a place like this, but the his theory was that if you built a system to do it, you would forget how to do it. Therefore, you needed to do it manually all the time. Uh, unfortunately, what, uh, what this ended up reaping was extremely low site availability and just it was a mess. So metrics include 200 on-call pages a week and two destroyed on-call pagers as a result of those 200 pages a week, right? Uh, go uh, Application releases started Friday night at 7 o'clock, and everybody, all developers and operations, would get online, and they would end whenever on Saturday they got done, right? Just your, your standard Big Bang sort of releases. Uh, and so my team... It had been formed out of the other IT infrastructure teams because they had learned early on that you know, we, we had your standard IT infrastructure set up of you know, Unix team, Windows team, network team, storage, like eight different teams. They figured out pretty early that having all of those folks trying to support the website was destined to failure, so they put us in as like a glue team. And today you'll see some people be like, I'm going to put a DevOps team between Dev and Ops. Uh, and that's what, that, uh, that's what that looked like. So what we did there, the first step was stop the bleeding, right? So when you have 200 pages a week and all this downtime, you don't really have a lot of opportunity to do anything else. So getting metrics, kind of starting to track quality of life, doing root cause analyses on those 200 metrics and figuring out what, what it is that's causing them. Uh, and doing all that is kind of your first step. And then we automated our way out of some of that, uh, automated service restarts, application deployments, essentially trying to cut out big chunks of the work that were going on so that we could then automate higher value things. Um, we, we really uh, worked, uh, worked a process up where we hadn't yet, like DevOps wasn't a thing yet, right? So we didn't figure out the whole embed people in the teams, but we did come up with a process that the development teams should look at during each phase of their service. It's like, okay, you're designing the service, here's the operational questions you need to ask yourself. Okay, you're coding it, here's, you know. Uh, and, and so we did a lot of that, and then once we got under, out of under the, the big crush, we started partnering with both the apps teams and the business. Uh, the, it used to be kind of business team talks to developers, talks to 
operations team. So one of the things I did was get us a seat at that initial table and drive some, some common, some common uh, 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 goals. You know, the, the marketing department wanted higher performance and availability and all that, but frequently that was treated as an operations problem, not as a everyone problem. And so we got through that, and after a while, like, we got staffed up, we got really good at this, and we, we formed a security practice and an application performance management practice, kind of centers of excellence. A lot of our developers in that organization were hired right out of uh, college. They were one of the, they're still one of those places that does a lot of hiring for talent. The people in the operations uh, uh, team tended to have more experience, so a lot of the more uh, high-level things ended up uh, finding a home with us. So this worked pretty well. So the, the thing that I'm the most uh, proud about is that the, the director of marketing really started to value our team. Before that, he barely knew we existed, right? Uh, but he, he eventually said, you know, you guys, you know what it is that I'm trying to do, and you help me do it. Um, and we improved, you know, we improved the quality of life of the engineers. We improved uptime. But... It was, it was not an unqualified success. So we improved a lot of things, but in the end, we were still the bottleneck. So I, I remember one meeting I was sitting at, and uh, all, it was the, you know, the business and apps and, and all of this, and they're just like, yeah, the web admins are doing great work, all this, but, but they're still the bottleneck of us getting things out. And that was my first uh, kind of epiphany moment. I, I said, you know, We've invested a huge amount in tooling and in process and in doing all these things. And whenever I talk to other people in the industry, our vendors, they, they are very complimentary about, you know, it's like, oh, you guys are doing some very, uh, very high-end stuff. But there has to be something fundamentally wrong. Like if this is the amount of success that it's possible to have pushing this much, much work at it, like, that can't be right. There, there has to be some other solution, right? There hadn't been any DevOps days yet still at this time. Uh, the, the Velocity Conference had just started, and that was, we had gone and started, started you know, hearing some of the things other people were talking about. So the next thing uh, that I did was move into a different role. So our engineering department decided it's time to get into the, world of SaaS products. We, we hear the kids nowadays love SaaS products, right? Uh, so uh, they, they started a Greenfield team and they tapped myself as a systems architect and a number of other people from our IT organization to come over and start that. Um, and they had a number of ideas of products they wanted, but it was all also experimental, right? It's like, well, is this something we can do? How, how successful can this be? And so, Given what we had learned, we went in with some initial decisions. So they said, okay, well, what, what do you want to leverage out of IT? What do you want to leverage out of engineering? We said, you know, we want to leverage exactly nothing out of IT, right? Because we had learned the hard way that their goals weren't, weren't aligned with the sort of things we needed to be doing, to ship products, even, even just in the previous role, I, we had gotten to where we had okay kind of DevOps collaboration. I would say our, our ops ops collaboration was pretty bad, right? And, and as a team, as our values shifted to align with that overall web team and say, okay, well, we need to roll things out faster, we need to provide you self-service, we found ourselves having trouble with the other infrastructure organizations because those weren't their values, right? Uh, the one of uh, another uh, breaking point I had early on was uh, we brought in VMware. And so it took me, in general, it took me six weeks to get a new server out of all those teams because, of course, you would have to go from the Unix team to the network team to the data center team to, you know, and so on, right? So we put in VMware, you know, VMware comes in, does demos, look, provision new server, 15 minutes, it's all good. Okay, so we brought that in, and then guess how long it took me to get a new server? Four weeks, because the turnaround time for Dell to ship the server was removed. But 
all of that, I, I started to realize it's like, okay, it takes 15 minutes to make it. And we have four weeks of overhead. Like really, is, is that really okay? And IT organizations up to that time, they felt like that's okay, but it's not okay. Right, so, uh, so we said, never mind, we're gonna host it all in Amazon. Uh, we're going to use engineering's processes. So the engineering uh, department, they, you know, they have a lot of you know, ISO certifications and stuff like that. You had to do design reviews, have design documents, uh, had a whole new product introduction process. So we adapted that to Agile and we used that. Um, we had to give up all of our old tools. We had invested a lot in tools, application performance management tooling, but it was all either network-based or its licensing wasn't cloud-friendly, because again, this is kind of back in the day, right, where most people's licensing wasn't cloud-friendly. We knew that security was gonna be a huge barrier to adoption for these products. Uh, for, for example, one of the products we were coming up with is called the FPGA Compile Cloud, where people would upload their FPGA designs to be compiled. Well, that's super sensitive intellectual property. So we felt that both security uh, and a lot of the other operational uh, attributes, we felt like those were important to be kind of product features, not just something we were doing as a tax to produce the product, but that, that you know, if we leaned forward on security, that would help us uh, actually gain adoption of the tools. Then also we decided we needed to automate from the beginning. And we actually ended up developing our own tool. Um, we had a lot of uh, requirements to do, uh, to do some Windows automation, stuff like that. This is back when Chef and Puppet and whatnot, they existed, but they didn't have uh, much in the way of Windows support. But also, we, we had been doing this long enough. We said, you know, we want to be able to automate, oops, wrong button, automate everything. So when you draw out one of your systems back on your whiteboards, doesn't it look like this? Right, you've got your boxes, got your lines, pretty straightforward. So all of these different tools, do they actually model this? Or do they just provide little chunks that you still are having to conceptually align to model this? Um, so we said, you know, configuration management, so like the cloud and cloud provisioning gives you the yellow boxes. Those are like the roles of systems. CM gives you those little white boxes, but it gives you the lines, right, to, to oversimplify. <laughs> uh, it was a service management problem. So we decided to write, uh, write our own tooling. We basically modeled the system in XML. Um, this was a hard decision for us, because we said, you know, going in and writing our own CM and command dispatch and everything tool, like, that's a lot of work that we're biting off. But when we looked at the problem, we said, you know, we think we can do it, and we also think that the benefits of it will far outweigh the time we're going to spend on it. So, uh, so you know, we modeled the system. We had like a zookeeper-based service registry that kept everything hooked up. And so we had a system where you could replace a database server live and all of the services that depended on that database knew it and could just reparse their own configs and restart just automatically, right? And that was, that was night and day of an experience of, of administering systems. You're starting to see this approach show up a little bit more now with uh, especially a lot of the Docker and containerization orchestration tools, but treating this service level management as a first order uh, concern is something that was not done uh, at the time. So, uh, a lot of the other stuff we did, so collaboration between the development and operation staff, it's hard to get that shared culture. So I had the application architect come to me and he said, okay, we're having these design reviews. These operations people are asking me weird questions. I don't, I, I don't even know what they're talking about, let alone know the answers to their questions. Maybe we should have separate. We should have a dev design review and an ops design review and we should do that. And, and I said to him, well, so, You've seen how that turns out, right? Because that's the environment we just came from. I think if we power through that, and once we do enough of those, you'll learn what they're talking about. Like, I understand you don't know right now. It's not your fault. It's not their fault. It's a hard thing. But if we keep this up, you will know what they're talking about, and we'll be able to make a better overall product, right? And, and that's what we did. You know, sometimes you hit these bumps, and really the answer is, 
just keep doing it until you, until you can do it. It's like learning how to ride a bike. Um, so the big result here was that we discovered we could release software as a service applications in a third of the time that our organization could release software applications. So the average time to market for an NI software product is three years. Uh, SaaS product, we, we did this for three years and we delivered one a year, even with the hit up front of developing our own uh, whole provisioning system. So that, that, was a, that was a huge validation of the approach. Um, also, like our uptime was 100%, whereas the system we had just worked on that we could still see there at the same company was not trending to 100%. And so some of that, well, it's Greenfield, and Greenfield's always easier, right? But on the other hand, results are results. So it's like, is that a fair comparison? I don't know, but we've got 100% uptime, so uh, to a degree, the fairness uh, doesn't concern me all that much. Um, so. Meanwhile, the DevOps revolution had, had uh, kicked off, right? So and we, had gotten, uh, we had gotten hooked into it, uh, uh, kind of the, the quickie timeline, but a lot of the key DevOps folks came to Austin and did a thing called Ops Camp Austin in 2010. And out of just pure luck, I happened into that. I thought it was some local event and I showed up and I'm like, I recognize a lot of these guys from Velocity and stuff. What's going on? Uh, and so that out of pure luck, I, I kind of got tuned into it. And that was a big help because a lot of what we had done to this point, you know, now you have the benefit of a billion presentations that say to do a lot of the things that I just said we did. We didn't have the benefit of that. So we weren't sure if we were if we were going the right way or if we were going crazy rogue. <laughs> right, like, develop our own service management system, like nobody else is doing that, or like, are we just stupid? Is that our problem? But, uh, but uh, this really helped us uh, uh, understand, and as a result, I really value that ecosystem. We, we started a DevOps Days Austin uh, immediately, and, and that's still going on. We're in our fifth year, so come on out to Austin uh, this year for DevOps Days. So my next job was at uh, Bizarre Voice. Uh, Bizarre Voice is a software as a service company uh, that does ratings and reviews uh, as a service. So for example, if you go to walmart.com and look at all the product reviews, those are actually collected, curated, and hosted by, by a third party service, right? Uh, so very large scale because like we weren't doing that for one retailer, we were doing it for like 30% of leading brands and a lot of the top retailers, right? So, uh, so very large scale uh, systems. My first job there was uh, release manager. So they had been making the transition to agile and had hired up a bunch of uh, engineers. They had, it had started off as a more uh, marketing driven company that outsourced a lot of its engineering, but they decided to pivot into a more engineering driven company. So they brought a bunch of folks in, moved to Agile, and they tried to move from their kind of big 10-week release cycle to a two-week release cycle as they started going into sprints, and it failed awfully, right? So you know, they, they're like, great, release, and everything, uh, everything fell apart. Uh, so they said, okay, well, let's, let's bring in somebody that's going to help us uh, make, that, make that work. And so that's, that's where I came in. Uh, I didn't actually have a team. I just uh, I was working with engineers on the various uh, development teams. So this was your standard first-gen SaaS product, right? So still kind of monolithic in architecture. Um, a lot of branching, uh, very low percentage of automated testing. And those two things create a, create a vicious cycle, right? So the longer your cycle is, the more temp tempted people are to make late check-ins because they're like, wow, well, we can't wait like 12 weeks for the next release for this one because Cabela's really wants it or, or whatever. Uh, and so those releases were always slipping. They always had issues. Uh, there was a lot of kind of, you know, devs would throw it to the QA and then QA would throw it to operations and that was, the, that was the process. And then also a lot of the other teams that were stakeholders in this, they felt like they never knew what was going on. And as a company that's producing 
a SaaS product, like it's not one of your portfolio of products, it's your primary product. Everybody in support and implementation and sales, like they wanted and needed to know what was going on with this system, uh, but they hadn't moved past, you know, uh, sure a lot of you have IT organizations where you shake your fists at them because they never tell you anything about anything that's going on, and, and that was the pain that they were feeling. So this, this was different, right? So my previous two uh, kind of DevOps transformations didn't really have much to do with the release process. Um, even the SaaS stuff at uh, National Instruments, we got to where we could release any time. Continuous deployment wasn't part of what we did because that wasn't the problem we had. Right here, this is the problem we had. So when when you do DevOps, like you, you can't just take the formula and be like, well, continuous integration and, develop, and uh, delivery that's going to solve your problem, if you don't know what the problems are. So a lot of our problems uh, had a lot more to do with systems management in those previous roles. Uh, here, product management supported us in letting the dev teams take off a couple sprints uh, to essentially up their percentage of regression testing, automated regression testing. We did some core, core tooling. Um, we changed the branching strategy to trunk only. So there's trunk, and then there's a single release branch that we cut right before each release. The only thing that can be checked into it are fixes for critical bugs that have been found in that release, right? We put responsibility on the original developer to shepherd that change all the way through to production. It's like, no, you don't reassign that JIRA ticket or whatever, like that is, that is your change. You need to make sure that it makes it through all those steps. If it fails in test, if it fails in deploy, like it's your problem, it's your, it's your baby. You need to make sure it gets all the way through. Um, and we did a lot of communication around, uh, around the releases. This is something in my previous roles as well, I had a lot of luck with really just ramping up the level of communication, both to direct and indirect stakeholders. Um, I, I mean, I would have people come into my office where it kind of looked like they were on the verge of tears and they would say how happy they were that somebody was finally telling them what was going on. It's like that release got delayed a day or whatever and like they really needed that information. Now you'll have one in 20 people that, that will tell you you're over communicating those people are assholes and you need to ignore them. Right, tell them that you have a junk, you got a junk folder in your email for a reason. If for some reason, and especially at Bizarre Voice, I'd say, well, if you think that you don't need to know what's going on with the core server that makes, the service that makes all of our money and all that, you can put that in your junk folder, but like, frankly, if I were you, I would think about my life a little bit before you did that. Uh, so the results of this, so our first re release, the time came and it was no go. And this is actually very positive because up till then, like nobody, nobody wanted to be responsible for delaying a release. It was always finger pointing. It's like, well, the release is going to slip, but it's because QA isn't getting done in time. Well, we're not done in time because the devs, whatever. Here we had set up, you know, standard go, no go meeting, all the dev. Uh, managers came in and they looked at it, they sweated for a while before they could say this, but finally they said, you know, no, we don't feel like it's up to snuff, it's, it's no go. Uh, and so that release got delayed, had some customer issues when we rolled it out. Second one, on time with one issue. Third one, on time, zero issues. As everybody got used to it, it got a lot better. Um, and developing Developing that uh, discipline is important. You can't, none of these changes happen immediately because people can't, can't adopt change and have, have it become second nature immediately. You have to have revs on it, right? It's like exercise, it's like anything. Um, we tuned the process over time. When we'd have big blow ups, we'd add more process. When things started going well, we would remove process. So like those go, no, go meetings, those evaporated after a couple months because they weren't needed anymore. And every piece of process you have is an impediment, right? So you, you, you always want to be curating that and saying, okay, has, is that still needed or was it just needed at the lower level of sophistication we were at? Uh, and then because of all those changes we made a couple months later, I said, well, 
Smaller batch sizes are better. Let's go to weekly releases. And so going to bi-weekly releases had been this giant, you know, giant falderall multi-month thing. Everybody, I was like, send out an email. It's like, yeah, we're going to move to, monthly, to, month, to weekly releases. And people are like, oh, yeah, that sounds good. I'm like, okay, we're at weekly releases. And it was all fine, right, because we had set up all that discipline ahead of time so we could tune it to however frequently we did want to release. In this case, we still didn't necessarily want to do it uh, continuously because of uh, folks like the sales team and implementation team and all that, like they, they needed to be able to intake those changes because they were building on top of them. So uh, we didn't want to release more frequently than that, but we could. So that was the third one. My fourth gig, uh, I, I worked myself out of a job on that one. We turned the process into something that was easy, was automated and easy to do, and then we just started rotating it amongst the development teams. It's like your release manager this week, and so I was like, okay, my work here is done. So, uh, so they had me become an engineering manager of uh, the teams supporting the core, uh, kind of the core product I mentioned before, the monolithic architecture. So. Just like everybody else, right? We spawned a bunch of new teams that were going to rewrite the whole thing off to the side in, in microservices and all this. And then we were, you know, we were going to get that done and we we're just going to shift over, right? So, uh, so the first thing I started with was the operations team. We kind of declared the death of the operations team and embedded them into uh, the different uh, product teams. A lot of them went into the legacy team and then some of them went into the uh, new teams. Um, and we had a lot of uh, offshore outsourcers. Uh, they were very important uh, to our development historically, right? So there, we had outsourcers that had many more years of experience on the code base than any of our incumbent engineers. So problems here, so who's heard of the strangler pattern, you know, at the conference? So, so eh, that word hadn't really been invented yet. So uh, th we had this assumption that we were just going to build up the whole existing stack, but brand new in like six months and then just shift over and it was going to be great, right? Hint, please don't come up with that plan. Uh, that, that legacy stack is still in existence today. <laughs> uh, so, so eventually we pivoted into more of a strangler pattern, but we didn't think that's what it was going to take. So we made some decisions that, that kind of put that team uh, uh, behind, the, uh, behind the eight ball a little bit especially because even though we ramped back new product development, we had huge data load and that data load was doubling year over year. So people would say, well, we don't, you don't need to do a new development. We're not adding big new features. I'm like, so being able to geometrically scale your data stack is a feature. Like, I don't know if you know that, but it's a feature. <laughs> um, so we were going, uh, Black Friday was a huge deal for us because, of course, it's a big deal for every retailer pretty much worldwide, and we're hosting most of them, right? So, so uh, uh, that, that's something where we'd serve out 2.6 billion you know, review impressions uh, uh, during one of those periods. Uh, we had, we had kind of poor SLA on our support tickets that were escalated to engineering, uh, and we had a lot of compliance needs. So uh, as a growing international company, right, besides your kind of SOX and ISO and normal stuff, TUV, AFNOR, like uh, all the kind of Europeans are a lot more touchy about privacy and security and stuff like that. So they have uh, some, uh, uh, you know, more prescriptive uh, uh, kind of uh, standards. So what I did, I had actually moved the ops teams to Agile first. In, in, this is kind of interesting. I moved the ops teams to Scrum, and then when they moved and joined with the devs, like, they taught the devs Scrum. Like, yeah, you don't usually see that. But that's how it uh, just evolved. And it was, that didn't work immediately. So I had like a 40-person team most of which had not been trained on Agile. So we tried to break them up into four teams and all that sort of thing, but it, it took a couple tries for them to really get it. Um, and the other big thing is balancing your backlog with your interrupt-driven work. This is something I could talk about for 15 minutes, but I'm running a lot of time, but the, that's something that 
operations teams, but also your development teams that are balancing new feature work with sustaining work. That's a key issue, and we, we tried a bunch of different uh, ways to do it. And again, developing custom software, like sometimes you need to do that. This was a, a, a visualization we put together for the metrics for our system. Because we had monitoring systems, we had 20 linear feet worth of Zabbix metrics. But they didn't really, it was very hard for that to tell you at a glance how your system was going. So we built one, did some more stuff, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so this, this worked out very well. We got our customer support SLA up. Um, we started measuring everybody's velocity once they went to Agile, and we could see that it was growing continuously using that embedded model. Um, and we successfully weathered those Black Friday spikes. Um, and as I mentioned, we had to pivot to, pivot to the strangler pattern for the, for the new stack. Um, but also all that automation, it made compliance easy. Uh, I had, uh, there's one time where we had some ISO auditors in, and they wanted to know about backups. And so I showed them the Confluence page and then the links to in source control where all the automation just automatically did all the backups and had retention times. And they were like, oh man, this takes us weeks in a lot of places, like done. You know, and that, that DevOps approach, it, it helped us really fly through a lot of those things. Uh, but one of the most important things, oh, I'll kind of close with this, is quality of life. We talk about culture a lot, right, in DevOps. We don't necessarily talk about, put the fine point on, on it and say it's about quality of life. So that, that whole Black Friday period, it's huge for our company, it's huge for our customers, it's a big deal, we do months of prep for it. But we didn't have a big you know, crisis room, everybody's working at the office over Thanksgiving weekend, everybody went home. Like that, that's that same visualization y'all just saw, and it's running next to my family's turkey and, uh, and cheesecake, right? Because that's what you want. Uh, a lot of the benefit of these things is that you're able to conduct business in a much less interrupt-driven, much less crisis-fraught thing, and that has a lot of benefits to your business, but also has a lot of benefits to your people. Right, and if your if your engineers and all of your people are, you know, not dealing with conflict and not dealing with painful interrupt work and not dealing with repetitive work, that's when you get their initiative. That's when you get their innovation, right? Uh, and so that's that's where you go with that. And so the uh, the end here is basically help your people, improve your latency and your bandwidth. So everybody talks about the value chain, right? And you're trying to shorten the steps in the value chain. That's kind of improving your latency from the network point of view. You also need to try to find chunks of work that are going into that pipeline that shouldn't be and automate them and get them out of the pipeline at all. Don't be penny wise, pound foolish. So we were never able to embed DevOps engineers into the teams at the, in the National Instruments gig because we didn't have enough. Like I actually, I came up with that idea out of my own brain and we tried it, but we we're like, well, you're gonna have to cover these three dev teams and you're gonna have to cover these three dev teams. And that doesn't work, right? And a little bit of, a little bit of you know, hiring two more ops engineers or whatever, if it allows you to go from playing man to zone, right? Uh, or from playing zone to man, that gets you a huge benefit. Uh, and my other two points that I won't read to you. Any questions? All right. Well, thank you. Uh, feel free and reach out to me if you want to ask questions. I, I know each one of those was quick, but I wanted to, uh, a lot of times here we either get theory talks or like one big transformation. And I wanted to show how, you know, you can kind of go through a series of them that have different problems and apply different, uh, different techniques and see how that works out in, in practice. So thank you very much. Thank you.